Good afternoon, everyone. Today is the obligatory memorial of St. Pius X, this saintly pope, the Pope of Children. Most people know of Pius X, don't they? Well, around here we do because there was a high school named Pius X in Pottstown. It has since then been absorbed to a new high school named after another saintly pope, Pope St. John Paul II. And that high school is in the Royersford area, or Upper Providence, they call it. So, uh, but Pius X, that high school, many of our parishioners went to Pius X High School. And John Paul II High School in Royersford considers Pius X one of their legacy schools. You know that all of those graduates and uh, of course that now is part of an alumni association of John Paul II, as well as Kennedy Kenrick, Kenrick, Kennedy, and St. Matthew's High School. They're all like legacy schools that are now part of the recently built Pope John Paul II High School, or affectionately known as PJP, Pope John Paul. Um, so 10 years, I think, or maybe even 11 years since the uh, opening of PJP. Isn't that amazing? Did that not go quickly? Time goes by. You know, this doesn't wait for anybody. Like, we just need to move along because before you know it, you blink and uh, another year is gone. Well, anyway, I think they're in their 11th year, PJP. And so, how beautiful is this saintly pontiff? Let's talk about Pius X, that saintly pontiff, uh, that Pope of children. He's well known for many things, but most specifically about allowing children because children were not given Holy Communion at such an early age. They waited. In fact, communion was delayed. Do you know, even in the history of the reception of communion, communion was delayed until later in life. It wasn't given the, the opportunity it is given now for daily reception. I mean, when you come to think about it, people today can receive two times in one day as long as there is a, another celebration. You know, there's a, I went to daily mass this morning, Father, Father, but I have a funeral mass at 11 a.m. And I would like to go there and I would like to receive Holy Communion. May I? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. You may receive Holy Communion at the daily mass. as all during the state of grace. That's, that's a, a fact, right? That, that we, we understand that. And that, can I receive Holy Communion at the 11 o'clock funeral mass? And the answer is yes, as long as you're in the state of grace, which means that you're free from mortal sin. That's what this, the state of grace is, because communion, the reception of communion, is the absolution for venial sins. Isn't that beautiful? You know, even in the confidior, that simple absolution that the priest gives you, you know, the simple absolution, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life takes away venial sins. The reception of Holy Communion takes away venial sins. I said, so that's beautiful. So what we're, when we talk about as long as you're in the state of grace, that means that you're freed from any mortal sin. And what is a mortal sin? It's a grave matter. So it's a grave matter. There's sufficient reflection and full consent of the will. So you've committed a mortal sin. You have to have those three parts that make the sin mortal. It's a grave matter. Sufficient reflection. I thought about it and I did it anyway. Full consent of the will. Once that happens, then you know that you've committed a mortal sin and you need to go to sacramental confession, okay? So, Pius X permitted children at the age of reason, which is around seven years old, 
to come forward for the reception of Holy Communion. So we have him to thank for that because normally people would not receive communion until later in life. And it was almost seen as a prize and not as a means of grace. It was almost seen as a reward and not as a mean of continual conversion. So I, I just want to place that before you on this day and also to talk about his coat of arms to restore all things in Christ. In other words, it's a beautiful motto to restore all things in Christ because things could get out of whack. I was saying this morning at daily mass, you know, the, the Holy Father, uh, the successor of St. Peter, we're, we're what, 266 of them now. We have uh, the, the, the blessing of the Holy Father to guide and lead the church, to guide and lead the, ch lead the church. Um, I know that Susan uh, gave me a beautiful picture of the piazza outside of St. Peter's Basilica, you know, the Vatican, and the columns that are like this. Do you ever see the columns that are like this? So you all know what that is. You know why they made it that way? It's our mother, the church, holding us together, holding the flock together. So it's symbolic of that. And I think if you ever take a look at the Vatican, Maybe Susie, you could like show the people yeah. that, you know, that that image oh, of the pretty. columns yeah. outside of St. Peter's Basilica. Mm -hmm. It's called St. Peter's Basilica, but it's it's all the Vatican offices are there, you know, and there's Vatican offices down the street as well. But I mean, most of the Vatican offices or the papal apartments uh, are right within the confines of the. Uh, the Vatican or the St. Peter's Basilica, of course, not in the church, not in the church, but you can see upstairs, the Pope's apartment, uh, various cardinals, officials of the Vatican, different, when we say departments, we also say dicasteries. I don't know if you ever heard of that word. They're dicasteries. They're different congregations or responsibilities of the church, maybe of doctrine, of dogma. There is a, uh, of marriage, which we're, we're talking about in this series, and I'll get back to that tomorrow. But I mean, uh, there's many things that uh, the Vatican has to take care of, but it's all in the understanding of our mother, the church, holding together the flock and holding together. And so popes throughout the years have done that. Now, some were stronger than others. It's, you know, God doesn't take away our personality. God leaves our personality and our, our whole demeanor when he calls us. So he doesn't just like zap us into a different personality or a different demeanor. I'm, I'm kind of the same personality I was last year and the year before, and it's all part of me, and you as well. And God uses us to bring about some good. So Pius X, even at a time when he was the Pope, he had to make sure like things were being restored, like things were not getting out of whack, always remembering that the, the ministry of the papacy is to govern to teach and to sanctify, right? To govern, to teach, and to sanctify. Here's another little tidbit, another little Catholic trivia. Do you ever remember the popes used to wear a, 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 a large, not a mitre, but a large headpiece? And it, was, it came in three kind of parts. Did you ever see that? And that was the three parts of governing, teaching, and sanctifying. It's beautiful. Go look at the uh, the Pope's uh, headpiece, not the mitre, not the mitre, not the pointy hat, but the the crown or 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 uh, a more uh, a more user friendly headpiece would be 
what, what I would say, more of a headpiece of the, uh, the Pope. And he was crowned that because you know why? I don't know if you know this, because the Pope is at the head of his own country. Did you know that that, that Vatican City State is its own country? Do you know they have their own flag? Yes, you do, because you know it's hanging in most Catholic churches. You see the American flag, that's our country, right? Well, the Vatican is its own country. So we have another flag of another country, of the Vatican City State. And so many people will say it's the papal flag. Okay, yeah, that's fine. But it's not a Pope's flag. It's a flag of a country in which the Pope is the head of that country. You know, that's why when there's a lot of protocol for leaders of countries, well, the Pope has the same kind of entourage because he's also a head of a country. And that is the Vatican City State. It's probably the smallest country in the world. The smallest country in the world. I forget, maybe a little over 200 acres. <laughs> but, but do you see what I mean? It's, it's their own country and their own police force, their own prison, their own post office. Their, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I'm sure a lot of you know about this because a, a lot of you Google things and find things out like that. Well, anyway, uh, when you see the, uh, the Vatican city-state flag, it's a flag of a country. And you see the American flag, it's the flag of the country. We hang them up in our church right in the, by the choir loft. We hang them off the choir loft, one on one side and the other one on the other side. So many, many churches will probably have them in maybe the vestibule, you know. Our vestibule is not really tall. We have a drop ceiling, so to, to put a flag there, sometimes we hit it. So it's best that they hung them in the choir room, which was a good thing. Well, anyway, to restore all things in Christ. So it was very important that pious did that at a time where people were coming up with different ideas and different goofy ways to say, mm, 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 mm. no, no, we have to get back into the realm. I also said, you're always going to have people who are going to be on the left side of the fence and the right side of the fence. As long as they're in the fence, as long as they're in, here, here am I going with that visual of the, of the piazza outside of St. Peter's, the columns that as long as you're inside the column, you could be all the way on the left and you're still Catholic. You could be all the way on the right and you're still Catholic. But go one step more to the right and you're outside. One step more to the left and you're outside. We have to make sure that we're in the arms of our mother, the church. And that's so important. And so Pius X did a lot of good to restore order and the deposit of faith to be held intact. You know, what we receive from Christ and the apostles, all that succession, that direct line, that deposit of faith is moving from Christ to the apostles to this day, to this day, and to make sure that it's not lost. Make sure that we really hold dear to the deposit of faith that has been entrusted to our care. The gospel today was about Jesus asking Peter, of course the first pope, do you love me? He asked him three times to undo the denials, the three denials. Remember Peter denied Christ three times and at Mass we say, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Well, we do that to remember that we too deny Christ through our own fault. But Christ asks us every day, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's the, the undoing of the denials. And that's what he asks Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than anyone? then I need you to do something. You need to feed and tend my sheep. And that is to govern them, to teach them, and to sanctify them. To govern them, 
To govern them, that means that you are the head shepherd, the visible head shepherd. I'm placing you in charge of the flock. So keep it together. Govern it in a way that is beautiful, loving, and kind. And I want you to teach. I want you to teach what I have taught. To teach all nations. It's important to teach authentically the gospel of Christ and its meaning. What does it mean? Anyone can read the gospel. But what does it mean? It can't have your opinion, your opinion, your opinion, your opinion. I say this all the time, but I have to go back to that because anyone could read the gospel. But what is it, what's its authentic meaning? Okay, next. To sanctify. That means to allow the sacraments to be present for all people. To make sure that the, there's the availability of the sacraments to many people. To many people. When I say all, well, many people who belong within the fold. I mean, if you're not part of the fold, if you've broken out of the fold, we're searching for you to come back. We're searching. The mother, mother church is always searching for souls to come back. She holds the light of Christ going out in the darkness to find them, bringing them home. But we have to understand that we need to be back within the confines of the safety of our mother, the church. That's so important. So the, the role of the, or the ministry of the Pope is to govern teach, sanctify. There's a Trinitarian formula for the ministry of the papacy. And Pius XII, I mean, excuse me, Pius X, Pius XII did a wonderful job too, but Pius X did a very lovely job to restore things, especially at a time where things were really being questioned. I think they're questioned in every age. I don't think I don't think one papacy has it over. I think sometimes things are very trying in certain parts of our world. And I think in certain parts, it's not as trying. But you know what the interesting thing about the Pope is? He has to take care of the entire church. So you may say, well, it's not affecting the United States. It, that's affecting France and Germany. Okay, well, the Pope has to teach the one church, not like the Church of France has a church and the Church of Germany has a church and the United States. No, it's one church. So when the Holy Father teaches, it's the oneness of it. So I think that's important to also understand. So I, I think you're getting all this. I think you're understanding where I'm coming from. That's why when I say and I talk about the, the word church, and I even mentioned today in the homily, and I even told the people in the homily, you're going to hear this from me because it is of prime importance. I mean, start asking your friends and your relatives and your children to give them to give you the definition of church. What is the church? What is a church? You know, how do you get that? How do you get that definition, church? You'll hear many different answers. But there's really only one answer. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus is saying this, my church. Okay, so what's his church? <laughs> like, what's his church? I mean, there has to be one voice, one dogma, one doctrine, one teaching. There can't be many. Because is that Jesus talking? Is that Jesus? Is that Jesus? I'm confused. I'm totally confused. What, what is the, and what is the voice of Christ? Who is teaching the voice of Christ? Who is giving us that message? 
So it's very important to understand that there is only one. Now you may have a husband that's Lutheran, right? Or Episcopalian. God bless them. God bless the Lutherans. We, we, we encourage everybody to be one. But unfortunately they're not, right? The church calls other denominations or other Christian religions ecclesial communities. Now I know we probably don't use that word a lot, do we, around friends? Uh, we probably say he belongs to the Lutheran church. But if you want to get theological, I, I wouldn't use that word. Because it diminishes the word church. Just like as we're going to talk about the word marriage. Like, what does that mean? If we use it for everything, then it's like, mm, that's not the proper understanding of the word marriage. So I just bring this out again, because repetition is the mother of learning. And I think the more you hear it, the more that it sinks in. Okay? So St. Pius X, that saintly pope, that has restored a lot back to Christ because a lot of things were getting whacked out, getting back into the focus of Christ and the mission of the gospel and the, the whole understanding of that gospel in our lives and to allow children to receive Holy Communion, the gift of the everlasting life, the food of the angels, to give it to these beautiful little kids is a blessing indeed and a grace which we still have today because of this saintly Pope. St. Pius X, pray for us. Have a nice day.